We'll start the last session today. I, it was 25 years ago or so that I first heard the name of Misha Meyer at the Tübingen home of my friend Hubert Kanzig, who told me about a brilliant historian of sport, the author of the entry Apopudobalia in the recently published first volume of the Neue Pauli. In that entry, Meyer described how the sport, invented in 4th century Greece and later brought to Brittany by the Roman legions, where it would eventually be rediscovered as football in the 19th century. Meyer, then 25, already showed those ubiquitous characteristics of the ancient historian in Germany, Israel, or elsewhere, audacity and humor. Indeed, the inventor of Apopudobalia had been none other than Meyer himself. Misha Meyer is a man of many gifts, enamored with various muses. Before his marriage to Clio, he had a serious flirt with Euterpe, as he tells us in, his, in the Antritzrede, or inaugural lecture he gave 12 years ago at the Heidelberg Akademie der Wissenschaften, he had, as a young man, hoped to become a music composer and orchestra conductor. His 1998 doctoral thesis, written in Bochum, dealt with archaic Sparta, while his Bielefeld Habilitation, published in 2003, discussed Justinian's century. Such a spagat, or sleep, the world of sport again, involving a millennium or so between the topics of his work, reflects the highly respectable and enviable tradition of German universities. From Justinian, Meyer naturally moved to studying the so-called Justinian plague, and from there to bedrohte Ordnungen, ruling systems under threat. The title of a major research project, SFB, Sonderforschungsbereich, he led as well as a, of a series he co-edits at Moor Zibek, in which pre-modern and modern phenomena are comparatively studied. With such a persistent broadening and daring of the inquiry, it is no wonder that Meyer was awarded last year the Leibniz Prize, the pinnacle of intellectual, scholarly, or scientific achievement in Germany. Actually, I suspect Misha Meyer of being a journalist, masquerading as a historian. His presence in Jerusalem these days may hint to his deeper hidden intention to observe from close up our own bedrohte Ordnung. The title of his lecture, Jerusalem under Heraclius 610-641, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and the end of the world, reminds me how Ihor Shevchenko, my teacher in Byzantine history at Harvard, taught us how the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 changed the destinies of this part of the world. At one of the many demonstrations against the attempt of our present government to radically transform the political regime of Israel, a poster held the inscription Demagog and Magog. Ominous topic indeed. Professor Meyer, the floor is yours. Yeah, many, many thanks for this very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Maren, for uh, the invit invitation uh, to this conference. The decades of Emperor Heraclius's reign were a period of most severe ex existential struggles for the Eastern Roman Empire. The emperor who, like his predecessor, the hated tyrant Phocas, had attained the throne only through a violent usurpation and whose position thus was initially weak, thank you, was drawn directly into the maelstrom of a murderous war against the Persian Sassanids in the course of which Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, and thus nearly the entire eastern flank of the empire were temporarily lost. Apart from the demographic material and economic damage, this had to lead to a profound loss of confidence in the rule of the Roman emperors, which could not be compensated in short and medium term, 
and subsequently heavily weighed on Heraclius and his confidence. When in 626 others and slaves took up the siege of Constantinople, while at the same time Persian troops on the Asian side of the Bosphorus awaited the fall of the capital, even the collapse of the Imperium Romanum was imminent. It would have completed a catastrophic scenario, the contours of which had already begun to emerge 12 years earlier. Already in 614, contemporaries had, had to endure a thunderclap with the Persian conquest of Jerusalem and the abduction of the relic of the Holy Cross to Ctesiphon, which deeply shook their worldview. All the greater must have seemed to, to them the miracle that Heraclius, since 624 at the head of his army on Persian territory, could announce to Constantinople in 628. The enemy had been defeated, the regime of Chosroes had collapsed. In triumph, the emperor could enter the capital in September 629. However, he was to have only a few years to enjoy the victory which was as unexpected as it was overwhelming, and to tackle the necessary restoration and reform measures before the expansion of Muslim Arabs destroyed all successes during the years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Anyway, there had been no peace even after 628. The religious division within the Christian majority was too deep, looking back by then on a history of conflict that had lasted nearly two centuries. In order to reconcile Chalcedonians and Myophysites, Emperor Heraclius and Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, jointly propagated the doctrine of monoenergism from the 620s onward, but failed due to opposition headed namely by Sophonius, the Patriarch of, of Jerusalem. The reworking of the monoenergetic -energe doctrine toward monothelitism in the Ectesis of 638 also brought no result. The religious conflict had rather intensified when Heraclius died. The adherents of different positions faced each other more irreconcilably, irreconcilably than ever. The dramatic events that took place in the seventh century and that raised not without reason the question why the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire survived at all are underpinned by eschatological expectations and fears of the last times, which had already dangerously condensed in the 6th century and were obviously maintained anew by the destructive war against the Persians six, uh, since 602, as well as the restoration work of Heraclius and the subsequent Arab invasions. The obviously affected Christians, as well as Jews and later also Muslims, they, they already flesh <clears throat> they, they affected them and they already flesh up in the traditions of the early 7th century and could sometimes be politically instrumentalized. For example, when the alliance that Heraclius concluded with the Turks, which possibly was war deciding, in anti chalcedonian and thus anti-emperor circles was proclaim proclaimed as a beacon of imminent end of the world. By allowing the Turkic mounted warriors to cross the Caucasus to the south and thus giving them the opportunity to plunder Roman territory as well, the emperor had opened precisely those iron gates that, according to legend, Alexander the Great had once erected to protect against the end-time peoples of Gog and Magog, whose arrival in the wake of the marauding Turkic allies was now prophesied. On the Christian side, the eschatological speculations spread in the 7th century, fi finally culminated in the Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius, which originated around 692 in northern Iraq. It reflected the experiences of the Muslim Arab expansion and quickly gained immense popularity not only in the Byzantine Empire, and not only in the Byzantine Empire. Greek, Latin, and Slavic translations of the text, originally written in Syriac, soon got wide circulation. The particular drama of the processes of upheaval in the Near East between late antiquity and the early Middle Ages is condensed temporarily under the, temporarily under the reign of Heraclius and spatially in three events that took place in Jerusalem, 
that is, the city that was considered holy by all three ancient monotheistic religions, that was identified as the pl place of the last judgment, whose special status was respected even by the Persians, and whose fate therefore impressed contemporaries in a particular way. It is about, first, the conquest of Jerusalem by the, per the Persians in 614, with its immediate consequences. Second, the restitution of the relics of the cross by Heraclius on 30th of March in 630. And third, the entry of the Caliph Umar into the holy city in 638. All these events followed, thus my thesis, specific scripts which were predetermined by the eschatological grounding and are thus closely related to each other. So the Persian conquest of Jerusalem. In his recent monograph on the last great war of antiquity, James Howard Johnston has meticulously analyzed the events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in 614, not only discussing the sources once again, but also debating the difficult dating issues. According to his reconstruction, the advance of Persian troops in Palestine led to widespread insecurity, not least because it was accompanied by brutal Bedouin raids from which monastic communities and monasteries in particular suffered. The monks of the Hosiba monastery, located near Jerusalem, temporarily fled to the province of Arabia, um, to the Lavra Kalamon or surrounding caves and ravines. Among the, the ascetics of the Sabas monastery, in turn, the Bedouins wreaked havoc. The fact that just the holy men from the surroundings of the holy city had to take flight or became victims of barbarian raids might have intensified the widespread expectations of the near end. Not even those intercessors whom God has blessed had blessed were safe now, a situation similar to that which had been described so vividly by John of Ephesus in the 6th century. <coughs> After the Persian army under the command of Shabawas took Caesarea, it took its headquarters there and accepted the submission of the cities of Palestine. Gift-laden envoys also arrived from Jerusalem, to whom the Persians guaranteed peace and prosperity and, at the delegation's explicit request, gave a small garrison. Apparently, Patriarch Zachariah had initially been able to convince the people of the city to seek a settlement with the conquerors in order to avoid bloodshed. Apart from that, Shabaras's restrained actions indicate that the Persians were concerned not to allow any unnecessary unrest to arise in Jerusalem. This was all too understandable, not least in view of, consider of considerable Jewish and Christian populations in the Sassanid Empire, but was possibly also intended to contain the further spread of politically dangerous eschatological expectations which with which the Persians in Palestine must inevitably have come into contact. But the peace lasted only a short time. Immediately after the Persians had advanced into Palestine, some Jews had joined them in the hope of finally throwing off the yoke of Roman rule. Tensions between the religious communities, which already existed, intensified dramatically and led to open outbreaks of violence around Jerusalem, in Nazareth, Tiberias, on the hills of Galilee, and in Tyros, Jews allied with the Persians are said to have killed Christians and burned churches. There were also riots, riots in Ptolemais, Akko, where numerous Christians had taken refuge, and Christians were murdered, their property looted, and churches destroyed. After all, in Jerusalem, on Easter Day 614, the circus groups allied, publicly suspended the agreement made with the Persians, attacked the Persian representatives, and finally the Jews. They were soon joined by a larger crowd, and open rioting ensued, causing a massacre among the Jewish population. Only a few escaped to Caesarea to seek protection and help from the Persians. Immediately, Shabarats prepared his army and led it against Jerusalem, where the siege began at the end of April. Zechariah 
faced with the shards of his compromise policy, requested relief from the Roman forces stationed as Jer at Jericho. But these promptly withdrew in the face of the size of the Persian army. This, in turn, encouraged the Bedouins to launch further raids, whereupon all the monasteries in the Judean desert had to be evacuated, a devastating signal to Christian contemporaries, some of whom indulged in dark visions that attributed the events to the sins of people, framing them in apocalyptic imagery. Probably on the 7th of May in 614, the city fell. Three days of killing and looting followed, followed before Shabawats, put a stop to the rampage. Persian troops were to remain in Jerusalem for another 21 days before retreating into the surrounding countryside. Whether the conquest of Jerusalem actually took place with the exceptional cruelty and destructiveness reported by Christian sources may be doubted and attributed to the special status of the holy city and the experience of its loss. It is rather probable that the Persians still took account of the special significance of the site even under the conditions now given. In any case, the archaeological findings do not indicate any dramatic destruction, and Modestus, who was the provisional administrator of the Patriarchate after Zechariah was taken away, was able to have the damaged churches restored in the following years. However, after the 21-day occupation, another terrible massacre occurred, this time of Christians. After the Persians has, had selected people useful to them, including Patriarch Zachariah, for deportation to Ctesiphon, thus dividing the population into two groups, those people who were to remain in place were gathered in the Mamilla Basin. Trying to execute the leaders of the anti-Jewish pogroms, some Jews were re uh, here wreaked havoc on the Christian population. A mass grave with a small burial chapel found in a cave not far away probably dates back to these events and confirms the account of the written sources in this case. Far greater impression than the bloodbath in the Mamilla pool, however, was to be left by the abduction of the relic of the cross. It found its way to Ctesiphon together with the deportees. Thus, the Christian Romans had not only lost their central object of worship, the focus of their religious self-image, stolen from the holy city, the place of the death and resurrection of their savior, they had also lost the object in which since Constantine and the emergence of the Helena legend, the close connection of the Christian emperorship with God had materialized, that means an instance of legitimation of fundamental importance. Thus, the catastrophe of the Christians was also a catastrophe of the Christian emperor. Not least from these reasons result the later efforts to stage the recovery of the cross as a singular achievement and new beginning of an age. Even after the outbreaks of violence, that led to the conquest of Jerusalem and the subsequent bloodshed, no larger Persian garrison seems to have remained in the city. Rather, after the anti-Jewish pogroms had ended, Shabawas apparently contented himself with punishing the rioters, carrying off parts of the population and the relic of the cross, and replacing political leadership by turning over the administration of Jerusalem to the Jews who probably even continued to, coin, to mint coins and temporarily established a cult of sacrifice, uh, sacrifice at the site of the former temple. The face of this Jewish rule is only weakly documented in the sources. What we have, nevertheless, is a lead seal that testifies to an archon Yosina in Palestine, and it is also unclear how long this face lasted. Far more important in our context is another aspect. On the basis of an analysis of contemporary and later Jewish apocalyptic texts, Lutz Kreisinger was able to demonstrate a few years ago that the new rulers of, over Jerusalem focused the widespread eschatological expectations on the holy city and apparently understood themselves at, at, as administrators of an eschatological empire. It was under the leadership 
of Nehemiah ben Hushiel, who was apparently ascribed messianic qualities similar to those of the Samaritan Julian barely a century earlier, and who met an equally violent end. In the Apocalypse, Zephyr Zerubbabel, composed or redacted around 630, he is identified with the Messiah Ben Joseph. In any case, the Persian invasion of Roman Palestine seems to have been perceived by Jewish contemporaries, by how many, unfortunately, remains uncertain, as an apocalyptic event, hardly surprising against the background of widespread, widespread eschatological expectations among the Jews. These flash up, for example, in the Doctrina Jacobi, a fictional conversation set in Carthage in the year um, 634. Quote, and as we strolled about, some of the Jews told us that the priest of our Jewish community in Tiberias had had a great revelation, Apocalypse in Megalen, in a vision which told him that after eight years, the anointed one, the king of Israel, the Christ, would come, that he would be born of a virgin and that he would raise again the people of the Jews. And we were all full of great joy and inexpressible rejoicing, saying, Blessed are that virgin and her parents from, it, from whom the anointed one will become flesh. From the contemporary mysteries of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, we hear that some Jews regarded Muhammad as a prophet who sent to the Arabs was to announce to Israel the approaching end of Edom, that is Rome. The Doctrina Jacobi, on the other hand, polemicizes fiercely against this. With regard to Jerusalem, the following significant part passage is found in Sefer Zerubbabel. Concealed there, Tiberias, as well, is a man whose name is Nehemiah ben Hushiel ben Ephraim ben Joseph. Zerubbabel spoke up and said to Metatron and Michael the prince, My lord, I want, to, I want you to tell me when the Messiah of the Lord will come and what will happen after all this. He said to me, the Lord's Messiah, Nehemiah ben Hushiel, will come five years after Hepsiva. He will collect all Israel together as one entity, and they will remain for four years in Jerusalem, where the children of Israel will offer sacrifice, and it will be pleasing to the Lord. He will inscribe Israel in the genealogical lists according to their families. But in the fifth year of Nehemiah, and the gathering together of the holy ones, Siroi, this is um, the Persian king, Kabades Siro, the king of Persia will attack Nehemiah ben Hushiel and Israel, and there will be great suffering in Israel. Other Jewish sources also attest to the messianic group in Jerusalem and furthermore suggest that it was under great pressure. It apparently did not remain unrivaled, nor was it accepted by all Jews. The situation in Jerusalem seems to have finally escalated to such an extent that the Persians ended the rule of the Jewish messianic group and took control of the city themselves. As mentioned, the loss of the holy city meant a catastrophe, especially for the Christian emperor, and thus for Heraclius, as it inevitably had to call into question the divine entrustment of rule over the Roman Empire. Stunt, the author of the Chronicon Paschale, therefore records after the arrival of the terrible news in Constantinople, in this year, in about the month June, we suffered a calamity which deserves unceasing lamentations, for together with many cities of the East, Jerusalem too was captured by the Persians, and in it were slain many thousands of clerics, monks, and virgins, virgin nuns. The Lord's tomb was burned, and the far-famed temples of God, and in short, all the precious things were destroyed. The venerated wood of the cross, together with the holy vessel, vessels that were beyond enumeration, was taken by the Persians, and the patriarch Zaharias, Zaharias also became a prisoner. And this has not taken a long time to come to pass, not even a whole month, but a few days. On the other hand, however, the event also provided enormous mobilization potential that merely had to be skillful tipped. Over the next few years, Heraclius and his fellow surges, the patriarch of Constantinople, were to develop nearly excellent skills in this field. 
Already at the beginning of Lent in 615, a new chant was introduced into the liturgy of Hagia Sophia as the Chronicon Paschale reports. It invoked the heavenly protectors, Nun Hai Dynames, Ton Uranon, Syn Hemin Horatos, Latroyusin. It invoked Christ's entry into Jerusalem, Iduga Eis Poroetai Ho Basilois Tes Doxes, thus already suggesting to the people of Constantinople immediately after the catastrophe some elements that would later become constitutive for overcoming the calamity on site. At the same time, a new silver nominal was issued, the hexagrams. They flanked the halving of the nominal values of the coins and thus also of the income of state officials, becoming a symbol of the extreme plight of the community, which was also verbalized most forcefully by the imploring coin inscription, Deus adjuter Romanis, God help the Romans. On the reverse, Meanwhile, the hexagrams showed the cross on a globe above a step pedestal, making it as defiant as it was unmistakably unmist clear that the Imperium Romanum continued to lay claim to world domination under Christian auspices. Above all, however, the significant religious charge of the Roman-Persian War may have started with the conquest of Jerusalem in 614. After his departure for the East in 624, Heraclius appeared as the leader of a religious army and displayed such unwavering religious zeal that it was sometimes assumed that he had received priestly ordination. In a first symbolic act, he took revenge for the fate of Jerusalem and had a Zoroastrian fire temple destroyed in uh, the nearest Gansak in northern Iran, 10 years after the conquest of the holy city. Emphatically, the emperor made it clear that it was not he himself, but God alone who was leading the Roman army. On another occasion, he is said to have encouraged the troops with the words, quote, let us now sacrifice ourselves to God for the salvation of our brothers. Let us reach for the martyr's crown so that the time to come may praise us and God may reward us. With the prospect of reward in the heavenly afterworld for a warlike effort on the path of God, the jihad concept already resonates, which is also pro proclaimed almost simultaneously by Muhammad in the battle against Mecca. The war against the Persians was no longer regarded only as a struggle for the existence of the Imperium Romanum, but of Christendom in general. For this reason, Heraclius was able to state in the victory message he sent to Constantinople in 628 that Cosroes, the arrogant opponent to God who had profaned Jesus and the mother of God, had fallen. The restitution of the relics of the cross by Heraclius in 613. In an essay from 2013 that has received far too little attention, Konstantin Zuckermann proved that Heraclius, after the victory over the Sassanids, twice went to Jerusalem to restitute the relics of the cross. First on the 21st March, uh, 629, and then again on the 13th, uh, 30th March, 630. In between was the triumphal Adventus in Constantinople in September 629, where the emperor had celebrated himself as a victorious military leader and consolidated his rule anew before setting out again for the east at the beginning of spring. I have shown elsewhere that the arguments put forward by Zuckermann suggesting a double restitu restitutio crucis are not only convincing, but can be further supported by additional considerations. I cannot go into, detail, uh, in, into this in detail here. Rather, what is important in our context is the conclusion that the staging of the first visit to Jerusalem in 629 was apparently still largely improvised. The stay in the holy city may have served primarily to restore the old order formally and symbolically. It is likely, for example, that Modestus, who was still acting as locum tenens for the patriarchate, 
took this opportunity to verify the authenticity of the recovered relic as reported by Nikephoros. However, Heraclius may have already become aware on this occasion of the potential that lay in a solemn act of restitution, for he conceived his fourth novella in Jerusalem in 629, which in the poemium is explicitly called a threshold law, marking an end and a new beginning. Here, the idea of the beginning of a new age is already indicated, which was then to characterize the great enactment at the same place one year later. It must have been plausible for contemporaries, not least because um, March, the, 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 the 21st of March, was the vernal equinox, which, according to the contemporary chronicle in Pascale, was regarded as the date of creation and renewal of the world, as well as the beginning of times. As far as the emperor's itinerary can be reconstructed, he went from Constantinople to Jerusalem via Emesa, Damascus, and Tiberias. In Tiberias, whose Jewish inhabitants gave Heraclius a friendly welcome, a remarkable incident occurred. Christians raised an accusation against the Jew Benjamin, who had accommodated the emperor and his entourage in his house, an accusation that he had mistreated them, kakopoein. Taken to task by Heraclius, Benjamin justified himself by saying that the Christians were enemies of his religion, echtreutes pistius mu. The ruler then instructed him in Christian doctrine and had him baptized after his conversion. Although the Chronicle of Theophanes does not explicitly speak of a forced baptism, it is difficult to imagine that Benjamin's conversion took place without any imperial pressure. For Benjamin was in the highest danger of life in view of the charges put forward against him. Heraclius, in turn, may have been aware that he now had the opportunity to set an example just in Tiberias, a center of Jewish scholarship from which fierce resistance to Roman rule had emanated during the Persian invasion, and thus to refer directly to the events in the context of the conquest of Jerusalem, just as in the case of the destruction of the Zoroastrian fire temple at Gansak. The ostentatious references to the events of 614 are even clearer after the emperor's arrival in Jerusalem. Eutychius reports that the Christian inhabitants of Jerusalem led him to the Mamilla Basin and drew his attention to the traces of the massacre there in 614. After some hesitation, Heraclius had placed the Jews under his personal protection, the emperor finally ordered the murder of all Jews who could be found in the vicinity of Jerusalem and in Galilee. The historicity of this story is disputed. The same applies to the mitigated variant according to which Heraclius is supposed to have given the order for a forced baptism. However, this is not only found in suspicious late tradition, Michael the Syrian, but is also reflected in contemporary sources such as the Doctrina Jacobi and a letter of Maximus Confessor. It seems, after all, to have been so far-reaching that also Frediger in remote Gaul took note of it. And even discussions of forced baptism in, uh, of Jews in the Visigothic Spain may refer to it. So one will have to take the reports about the baptismal order seriously. Whether this also applies to the report of attempted forced conver conversions of Christians to Judaism in the context of the Mamilla blood, bloodbath in 614 is uncertain. However, some time ago, Lutz Kreisinger collected arguments for taking these allegations seriously. If at that time Jews really tried to convert Christians by force, the baptismal command of Heraclius could have been a direct, also enormously aggregated answer to it. At any rate, contemporaries must have understood it in this sense. Perhaps it was prepared by the banishment of the Jews from Jerusalem and a three-mile zone around the city of which Theophanes reports. It is quite conceivable that this order um, was issued during the first imperial visit to Jerusalem in 629, for it hardly seems reasonable that it should have been issued at the same time as the decree of baptism.
In the eschatologically charged atmosphere of that time, the emperor's all-encompassing baptismal command had to be understood as an apocalyptic event, because the conversion of all peoples was a precondition for the parousia of Jesus. Accordingly, the imperial measure led Maximus' confessor to concrete fear of, of the end of the world. In the tradition, the forced baptisms were linked very early with the so-called horoscope or dream of Heraclius. According to this, the emperor, who was interested in astrology, had foreseen that circumcised peoples would devastate the Roman Empire. In order to prevent this, he ordered all, that all Jews be baptized and thereby failed to recognize that the real danger came from the Arabs, who were also circumcised. Recently, Stefan Esters has dealt in detail with this story, which was probably forged very early in the Near East, which can already be grasped around 660 in the Chronicle of Fredegar, and was very and was varied many times, especially in the Arabic tradition. Esters rightly has pointed out his, its highly eschatological implications and context. These, in turn, might result not least from the significant Jerusalem reference, which might represent a core element of the horoscope. By presenting himself as a messianic uh, ruler of the last days, when he entered the city in 630, the emperor may have provoked counter-reactions in the Arab world, where the prophet Muhammad made similar claims at the same time. This competition may be the reason for the prominence of the episode in Arabic tradition. The context of the forced baptisms and the story of the horoscope of Heraclius is all sources agree on this, the Restitutio Crucis in Jerusalem. The ceremonial staging of the imperial entry into the city obviously followed a subtly elaborated plan and does not seem to have failed to have the intended effect. Centuries later, people were still recounting the event, and Heraclius was repeatedly invoked as a model. The core element of the spectacle was the emperor's over um, Christus imitation, which in particular tied in with the humility of Jesus and presented the ruler over the Oikumene in the role of the Verus Humilis. A striking density and intensity of references to Jesus had already characterized the ruler's representation of the 620s, culminating in the introduction of the new term cosmorystes, redeemer of the world, composed from New Testament usage by the contemporary panegyrist George the Pisidian. For the Adventus in 630, the aspect of humility referring to Jesus is in particular emphasized in the Latin liturgical text written between the end of the 7th and the middle of the 8th century, which, was, which has survived in various variants under the title Reversio Sancte Crucis. Stefan Borgehammer has proven that it contains descriptions and interpretations that are partly contemporary or at least close to the time of the events. In essence, the account probably goes back to traditions that must have been formed between 630 and 636 in the Near Eastern environment of the events. According to the Reversio, Heraclius tried to enter the holy city on a magnificently, magnificently decorated horse um, through the eschatologically highly charged East Gate, the same gate that once Jesus had passed through, the, through on Palm Sunday. Per eam portam quam dominum, dominus intraverat. But suddenly a stone wall miraculously closed the passage. An angel appeared in the sky and reminded the emperor of the simplicity and humility with which Jesus had made his way to Jerusalem. Heraclius immediately understood and reacted. Quote, then the emperor rejoiced in the Lord because of the angelic visit, and having removed the tokens of imperial rank, rank depositis imperii insignibus, he proceeded without shoes, girded only with a linen, with a linen belt, um, took over the cross of the Lord in his hands, and hastened forward, face covered in tears. 
and eyes raised to the sky, making his way to the gate. As soon as he approached with humility, the hard stones sensed the celestial command, and raising itself at once, the gate gave free access to those who were going in. At the center of the imperial adventus was thus, was thus the emphasis on imperial humility with reference to his archetypal embodiment in the humilis Christus as well in the humilitatis exemplar. The news of the imperial act of humility was obviously spread quickly. It is found in pictorial representation on the frieze above the north portal of the Cathedral of Mrein in eastern Turkey, which can be dated to 639-40. It is also mentioned in the contemporary Jewish Midrash and has even left traces in Islamic tradition. Tabari's history contains an episode that goes back to Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, a contemporary and former opponent of Muhammad, and father of the later Caliph Murvia. There, the merchant from Mecca reported that he had witnessed Heraclius, accompanied by generals and high dignitaries, going on foot to Jerusalem with the cross to pray there. It cannot be ruled out that even the beginning of the famous Quranic Zura Arum also alludes to the celebration of the Roman victory of, at Jerusalem, if one retains the conventional vocalization. Tommaso Tesei, in any case, has recently put forward arguments for dating the sura to the time after 628, contrary to the established chronology by Nöldeke. The emperor's demonstrative recourse to Jesus in Jerusalem to which George the Pisidian also alludes in his poem on the occasion of the Restitutio Crucis, was, however, directly linked to the events of the year 642. For the people of the holy city, the suffering of their patriarch Zachariah, who had been deported to the Sassanid Empire and later died there, seems to have already evoked the analogy to the Passion of Christ. Antiochus Strategos, who pays particular attention to this aspect, however, decidedly emphasizes the differences between the Savior and the Patriarch, whom the Persians had led back into the city just through the Eastern Gate after the segregation of the part of the population destined for abduction. Thus, according to the author, the Jesus parallel imposed itself, but Zechariah had entered the city only, quote, similar to Christ, not, quote, like Christ. The Cosmoristus Heraclius seems to have referred to it, and in any case, the population inevitably had to remember. But now, the um, Jesus similarity became a, a Christ identity, and with, a second pause, and, and with it a second parousia. And that is not all. Obviously, the restitutor of the Holy Cross was concerned to situate his adventures in a complex associative field of manifold signs and illusions in order to create a flexible network of possible interpretations. Accordingly, the reversio also contains references to Constantine mentioning a celestial sign of the cross and the Helleland legend inevitably associated with the relic of the cross. In this field of association, all testament parallels were also invoked. Contemporaries already saw analogies between the act of restitution and the deposition of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem and interpreted the latter as the conclusion of a new Davidic covenant between God and the chosen people, now the Romans. This reference back to David, the ancestor of Jesus, in whose tradition also the deported Zachariah had ex explicitly placed himself, corresponds with the introduction of, Davidic royal, of the Davidic royal title Basilois, officially attested for the first time just in that fourth novel, which was written during the emperor's first stay in Jerusalem on the 21st March 629. It is here referred to Heraclius and his son, the Pistoi and Christo Basileis, thus providing a frame of reference to the allusions of the idea of the beginning of a new age contained in the announcement of a threshold law. The very fact that both rulers were identified as Basileis 
signaled to the empire's population that a second Davidic dynasty now stood at the head of the Imperium Romanum. It is in this framework that one will probably have to interpret the numerous Davidic references that are characteristic of the representation of Heraclius and were even perceived in the Merovingian West. The new dynasty inaugurated a new age, the contours of which began to emerge tentatively during the emperor's first visit to Jerusalem on that momentous March, uh, 21st March 629, and which finally took shape with the restitution ceremony the following year. One may speculate whether to usher this in this new age, first construction measures were even undertaken for a large church on the Temple Mount, which was to represent the new covenant monumentally. In any case, it is difficult to imagine that the imperial visit should not have initiated any building activities at such a prominent and symbol-laden site. And indeed, evidence had been adduced to suggest that the later Dome of the Rock, the earliest Islamic monumental building ever, completed under, Ab under Abd al-Malik in 691, with this octagonal structure reminiscent of Byzantine church architecture, could date back to planning or initial measures under Heraclius. Allusions to the inauguration of a new age under Heraclius can be found in contemporary literature. Thus, the Panagoras George the Pisidian states in his Heraclias, quote, and now he will, he will create a new life, a new world, and a new creation. And uh, George adds, 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 adds elsewhere, once again, parallel, paralleling Heraclius and Jesus. O architect of such great wonders, who accordingly to you to you will, if necessary, close the upper gates and opens them wide again, if it occurs to you, and seems useful, be present also now and open the lower gates, because gates of the inhabitants of the world we call the city which you have erected. And grant that he who has received power from you, the world's redeemer, Cosmorystes, the persecutor of Persia, yet more you, who has also saved Persia, that he may rule all the realms under the sun. Show how the earth imitates the heavens in that a single sun rules also over those who dwell below. For he who arose as the slayer of the Persian world must also be ruler of the world, Cosmicos. Despotes. In our context, it is of particular importance that this age was typologically distinctly different from all those new beginnings that were proclaimed almost with every new regime of a Roman Empire, emperor and glorified in panegyric. For just in his poem about the Restitutio Crucis, George presents the new era as the final phase of earthly history, leading directly to the last day. This corresponded to contemporary perception, as the author of the Translatio of the Relics of Anastasius demonstrates, who also saw himself as a member of the last generation, Epites Hemeteras Eschates Genias. The Cosmorystes Heraclius, however, sent a clear signal to the Christian people of Jerusalem, to whom Sahariya had already preached the approaching end of the world after 614. And uh, Heraclius sent a signal that he, as the new messiah, had taken over the task to advance on the arduous way to the end. Against this background, the Restitutio Crucis was, as Cyril Mango has aptly put it, a deliberative apocalyptic act. Here, the basis could have been laid for a conglomerate of associations from which the idea of the world emperor of the last times was to develop in the following decades. According to this narrative, at the end of times when the Antichrist appears, the king of the Greeks, that is the Roman Empire, proceeds to Jerusalem, restitutes the cross on Golgotha, and lays down his crown on it, symbolizing the, end, symbolizing the end of all earthly rule, in order to then hand over his soul to God. The Antichrist will appear, but will perish in the subsequent parousia of Jesus, which will be accompanied by the redemption of the faithful. The connection between the events of the years 614 and 630 in Jerusalem are thus closer than previously assumed. Heraclius not only took revenge on the Jewish population by issuing the order for forbaptism and possibly 
even commanding the murder, but he also carried out these steps in an eschatologically vibrant climate in which the order for baptism found a new, now eschatological context, as did his imitation of Jesus, which in the context of the dawn of the last age went far beyond the recourse of the example of Zechariah. The ceremony of the year 630 took place against the background of Christian expectations of the near end and thus responded to the short phase after 614, which was characterized by similar Jewish expectations. It is possible that Jewish apocalypticism responded to the appearance and claims of the Christian cosmoristes with the introduction of the anti-Messiah Armilus, who is first attested in Sefer Serubabel, who is often associated with Heraclius and was also to attempt to enter the holy city through the east gate. The entry of Caliph Umar into Jerusalem. Jerusalem occupied a central position not only for Jews and Christians, but also for the emerging Muslim community. At the time when Heraclius restituted the relics of the cross, Muslim prayer was temporarily directed toward Jerusalem. Muhammad himself is said to have been caught up in a spiritual night journey to the holy city and to have ascended from there to heaven. In particular, for eschatological expectations, which played a central role in early Islam, as not only Paul Casanova at the beginning of the 20th century, but especially also recent research has shown, Jerusalem was also of eminent importance. The fact that the Roman emperor solemnly entered the city, staging himself as the Jesus-like Messiah and inaugurator of a last age as the Cosmoristis, while at the same time the prophet proclaimed a new messianic message, pointing to the end times, must also have been perceived on the Arabian Peninsula. First Arab attacks on Byzantine positions in Muta in Jordan in 629 and Tabuk, northwestern Arabia, 630, may have been a direct reaction to this competitive situation. Above all, however, reports of the second caliph Umar's entry into the holy city in 638 reveal the profound effect that Heraclius's ceremony must have had on the prophet's followers as well. Even, through, even though the sources are difficult and complex, significant contours seem to emerge, especially if one assumes that contemporaries were familiar with the events of 614 and 630. Like his predecessor, Umar apparently presented himself ostentatiously modest and humble. By arriving in Syria, at least in the tradition represented by Tabari, riding on a donkey, just as Jesus once did in Jerusalem. Upon his arrival in the city, he wore only a shabby camel's hair cloak, so Patriarch Sophronius is said to have imposed new clothes on him. Christian authors interpreted the caliph's appearance as a diabolical pretense, hypocrisinte satanicen and degnumenos. Okay. Thus implicitly evoking the idea of the Antichrist, framing the event eschatologically. Umar is also said to have appropriated the Davidic tradition, what contemporaries had to relate di directly to the enactment of Heraclius. Regarding the eschatological background of the events, however, another aspect is of particular importance. Umar is said to have adopted the, epi the epithet Farouk on the occasion of his entry into the holy city. The range of meanings of this term, literally translated as one who distinguishes truth from lies, is oscillating and subject of debate among researchers. Um, However, there is some evidence suggesting that it refers to a messianic rivalry between emperor and caliph. For in adopting this ep epithet, Umar apparently deliberately referred to widespread, especially Jewish, messianic expectation 
by emphasizing religious eschatological connotations that had long been associated with the term as word history and also word usage in related Semitic languages prove. The Hebrew and Syriac counterparts mean savior and redeemer. The polymath Al-Biruni, for instance, points out around the year uh, thousands that among Nestorian Christians, al Faruka was used in the sense of redemption, and Faruka Rabba meant the great savior. The Quranic word Furkan, as a deriva derivation of Syriac, from, from the Syriac, was also interpreted in the sense of salvation. Thus, the Battle of Badr appears in the Quran as the Day of Salvation. And in the Arabic version of an episode associated with Sophronius of Jerusalem, al Farouk even appears as the title of Jesus. Umar's epithet thus ultimately meant nothing else than the Redeemer, and thus corresponded exactly to the Greek term cosmoristis, with which Heraclius was adorned to emphasize his messianic qualities. The entry of Umar in 638 into, into the just conquered city of Jerusalem thus represented a deliberate counterstaging against the Restitutio Crucis eight years earlier when Heraclius had presented himself in a special way as Jesus, Messiah and end time emperor. If we assume that, caliph in a, that the caliph in adopting the epithet al Farouk may also have been deliberately addressing Jewish expectations of the Messiah, we come full circle back to the events of 614, 614, which mark the beginning of a historical unique struggle between the three Abrahamic world religions for their holy city that took place within a quarter of a century under the rule of a single Roman Empire, uh, emperor. The background of this struggle was formed by most intense eschatological expectations, and only if these adequately taken, are, are adequately taken into account, it is possible to understand the merciless harshness and brutality with which that struggle for Jerusalem was fought in the first half of the 7th century. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Professor Meyer, for this uh, wonderful overview of these very intense uh, decades. Uh, uh, you did it beautifully. I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of questions, and uh, I open the floor. Uh, everything seems so obvious to everyone, uh, but I'll start. Uh, I will, uh, Andreas Caploni, uh, who works on the late 7th century Jerusalem, on the Islamic uh, rebuilding of the, of the Haram Sharif, proposed somewhere, uh, worked on these things a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly where, proposed somewhere that, I mean, according to him, there were traditions showing that when the Muslims first come to the city, the Jews come to them, of course. They are, they are Farouk. They save them from the evil Christians, as they had thought about the, 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 the Persians before. And they convince them, they ask them and convince them to let them offer sacrifices on the Temple Mount, which was barren at the time, uh, on a wooden structure, which existed for some time. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Yes, I know that, um, I know that there's um, much discussion about um, this question, uh, whether there was uh, a new phase of sacrifice or not, but I, I'm not, I, I cannot, uh, you cannot answer say, uh, you cannot um, I, I do not know um, the evidence for that. And I'm sure. not sure um, if there's any evidence at all. Sure. I, I, I don't no, know. No, I, don't, I don't think we do, but I think this is the speculation of a very yeah. serious scholar. Another question is, I read somewhere 
that the restitutio crucis is made on sometime in the in the fall on Yom Kippur in order to help a conversion of the Jews. Do you mm. did you did you uh, did you find uh, such a proposal? Um, I didn't find it in uh, the literature which I know, but I would be glad. <laughs> okay, I, I will, I will it try to look it, it up. It, because it would fit to my... Yeah, to my thesis. I will look it up and if I find it, I will let you know. Yes. So, uh, um, what's very interesting, right? um, it reminds me of a very similar... Uh, wait, 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 wait. It reminds me of a very similar uh, event 80 years earlier with Procopius telling about the return of the holy relics by Just Justinian to Jerusalem. Hmm. Again, told he was told to do it by a Jew. Yeah. And is it a, is a sign that uh, I, there is no historical connection, but the, perhaps there is a, a similarity in the idea that in which was current between the Jewish community about the science come enter a, a, before the coming of the of the Messiah. Um, which is here, as yeah. I as I remember the um, passage in Procopius, um, there are no there are no eschatological implications. As I, as I have it in, in mind, um, I would say um, the link between um, both events is um, the instrumentalization by the emperors. Um, but um, in this specific um, Procopius passage, I cannot see any eschatological no, um, allusions. But I, but, but I must read it again. All right. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Oh. Yes. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for this paper. Um, I have a question about the um, Zubavel, the, the source. Um, I don't know anything about it. I just know about its reputation of being quite, um, quite late, quite um, crazy. And um, so I, I just wonder whether you can give us a bit background and how you read it and how you apply it to, to, to um, because it, it's key, right? It, it's key in your argument yeah, for, yeah. for the Jewish messianic um, expectation. So how, how far <coughs> can we rely yeah. on this source? Yeah, that's, that's my problem. I'm not a Judaist. Um, I, I also um, know um, this, uh, um, I, I, and I um, came along this source by chance. And um, I, um, what I can say about it um, is, um, is second hand is from is from the literature. Um, I, um, I have the quotation uh, the quotation of the text um, from the collection of Reeves, um, yes, and who has only a little bit, um, I think one footnote or so, um, and there he discusses mainly dating questions. And um, what I know from other um, texts is that the dating question is indeed um, the most uh, relevant problem concerning this uh, text. But um, what I see from my lecture is um, that at least um, the final redaction um, should have been around 6.30. So this seems to be communist opinion. But um, it... Um, the, the Judaists I, I have read um, say that it's um, one of the two um, most important um, Jewish apocalyptic texts from the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, not, not of the most important, one of the very few yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of the time. So this is a, this is a, a really important source. And its connection to Jerusalem is also clear. Yeah, yeah, this is clear. It is, it is mentioned in the text and, and also the, um, the, 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 the short period of messianic rulership in Jerusalem is also mentioned in this text. Yes, please. I had a question on the, on the um, forced conversion. Uh, um, it is a thing that, theologically speaking, is pretty difficult to justify. 
I mean, uh, theologians, Christian theologians are against it. So uh, that would have required some kind of uh, uh, work in the background in Byzantine society, like on, uh, at the Patriarchate, to explain why we're doing this. Because I think uh, like Byzantine theologians are anonymous. That that's, a, that's not a thing that you should do. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's indeed a, a very um, hard problem, um, uh, the, the for, false baptism of, of Jews, and um, there's a letter of Maximus Confessor um, in which um, he develops a lot of counter-arguments not to do this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the, most important, the two most important um, arguments uh, are the first... Um, that um, uh, the, the forced conversion only leads to producing bad Christians because the Jews uh, do, not, do not want to be Christians. And uh, the second um, argument is um, by forcing um, the Jews to, con to, to be being baptized, um, Heraclius would accelerate um, uh, the process uh, which leads to the end of the world. I have a stupid question. Why didn't the Persians destroy the relic of the Holy Cross? I mean, that's putting it very bluntly. That's to say, are there any texts that actually discuss when you take somebody else's relic and look after it, and when you destroy it? Because obviously both patterns exist in, the, in late antiquity. I've always been fascinated by that passage in Nabanius when he says the Christians stole a statue of Artemis. Oh, oh, oh. What do they want with it? Yeah, it's a, yeah. <laughs> why would they do? You know, why would they steal it? There are plenty of examples of them destroying statues, but when you steal it and then it can be stolen back and take, you know, what's the rationale? Is there any discussion of the rationale of when you keep it, when you burn it, when you don't? Yeah, this is a complicated question because um, nobody knows what the Persians really did with um, the relic. There are a few um, reports in the sources. Um, but nobody uh, can say whether it is true or not. Uh, there's one report um, that uh, the Persians um, trampled uh, on the relic and um, uh, tr tried to, 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 um, to mistreat it. And um, then uh, uh, at the end, uh, when, uh, when the war is over and Heraclius um, postul postulates uh, uh, that uh, the, the cross uh, shall be given back, uh, then there's uh, the very strange story that um, nobody in Ctesiphon in the palace um, can find the relics. Um, <coughs> and um, then uh, there's another aspect. Um, Cosways is said to have uh, one Christian uh, wife among uh, uh, his uh, women, this may might have been might have played a role, and even Cosroes uh, is said um, to have been uh, baptized um, shortly before his end. So there are a lot of of stories and episodes around uh, the cross, but nobody can say uh, what really happened to it and why the Persians um, didn't destroy it and what, what they really did with, with it. Thank you very much. Um, I want to mention in Jewish history, you have eschatological and messianic fantasies. Many times when there are very severe crises and very severe catastrophes and so on. Now, in the first half of the seventh century, you have the population of Jerusalem and perhaps of the whole country uh, traumatized twice within the space of, of a short period of time. So I think it's really not that surprising that you would come up with end of times fantasies, and eschatological and messianic uh, fantasies at this kind of collective trauma uh, situation. No, it, for me it's not surprising, but um, it uh, hasn't been um, considered uh, in research in um, this way. Um, I don't know why, but 
for me also it's not surprising. I know uh, similar situations from the 6th century, there we have the same um, phenomena. Um, yeah. But um, there are still um, scholars who, who um, argument against um, an eschatological um, interpretation of the 6th and the early 7th century. It's now 6.15, it has been a very long day, and I think we should thank Professor Meyer again and reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.